Today I'm going to talk about a strand of my research that is um, different from the one I just told you about. It isn't the Religion, Belief, Discrimination, Equality Project. I'm going to talk to you about all my work with, with Muslim women in Britain. Now, this strand of my work, formally, it probably began when I started my PhD in 2007 at the University of Gloucestershire. But um, if I think about when it actually started, it's prob probably been much longer than that. I am a convert to Islam, and as most converts, you go through this phase where you frantically want to read anything and everything about Islam. Anything you can lay your hands up on, you read it. You think about it later, you first read. Um, and in reading about Islam and in learning to know this faith that I've come to call my own, I began to find a disconnection. Um, I realized that the faith I accepted was very egalitarian and gave unprecedented rights to women 1400 years ago, the rights to own property, to engage in politics, and indeed to take on very public roles. However, this historical and theological ideal was very far from the everyday practice of Muslim communities. And then there was this other matter because, yes, the practice in communities is different from the text, but also the way Muslim women are perceived and represented in the media um, and in wider plural society also seemed to be another disconnection. I realized very quickly that, uh, that this was problematic. I read something in the text, lived experience was different, and, and representation in the media was different. And, and, this was something I needed to explore on a personal level as a new convert to Islam and, and perhaps also as this nascent academic who was beginning to critically examine this faith that she had once um, accepted. So my presentation today is going to take you on this journey. I don't know when this journey began, a long, long time ago, sometime in the mid-90s. Um, it's, it's a journey that still goes on. Last year, I ran a conference on Muslim women's activisms to again look at how Muslim women were articulating their, um, their struggles. I think that's a nice word to use in modern society. How were they bringing together their faith and their feminisms? So my talk is very fluidly um, constructed today. I've chosen to ditch technology, so I do not have a PowerPoint presentation. I think it sometimes makes for a more engaging talk. We will see if I'm proven right or wrong. So the first part of my presentation is going to go around, you know, is going to look at why um, I needed to demystify the Muslima. What social, what personal need did I have? What social need existed and why was it so, and still is perhaps urgently topical that we look at Muslim women and hear their voices for policy purposes, for academic research. The second part of my presentation is going to look at this whole business around faithful feminist, the love-hate Marmite relationship that Muslim women, Muslim theologians, feminist women and feminist theologians seem to have. They don't really see to eye to eye often, yet um, I postulate a symbiotic relationship would be something that would be of huge benefit to society. Finally, I'm going to try and reflect a little bit um, for the way forward for Muslim women's activism, both from a research perspective, but also from a sociological perspective. So why demystify the Muslim woman? Um, I go back to this three-way disconnection that I mentioned at the start of my talk. Um, and like I said, in my understanding, the foundational texts of Islam, the Quran, the Hadith, and, uh, and the vast majority of classical texts give women rights. You talk about men and women being created out of the same soul. You, you talk about believing men and believing women having equal um, opportunity in front of their creator, meriting equal reward. That you, you also hear about epithets and, and um, responsibilities assigned to the genders. And you hear the word kawam very often used in reference to men, men who are supposed to protect women and look after their rights in the family. There is also another term, mosana, which is used in the context of women, women as fortresses against evil. And both these terms are equally significant. These are honors, I, I believe, that are, you know, from a believing perspective, these are honors um, given to humankind by God Almighty. Um, these are also responsibilities. Both terms are equally valid. Both terms are equally important. Yet, in everyday discourse, in everyday conversation within communities, the word kawam is more often used than the word mosana 
try Googling both words and you'll see which word turns up the, mo the, turns up the most search results. The word Musana is almost invisible and, and that is where um, the bone of contention lies. Why is it that the former word kawam, which is a sign that assigns authority and responsibility to the male side of the Muslim community, why is it more popular than in the Muslim lexicon than the word mosana, which, which assigns similar responsibility and similar uh, authority to the woman? And, and this disconnection that I that I describe here between these two words is seen in so many different aspects of the Muslim community. So. The, the word hijab and the practice of hijab, why is it, go on to YouTube, why is it that you see so many more lectures about the hijab of women, this is how she should wear, and this is how she should speak, and she should, um, the hijab of the voice, veil her voice, but you do not hear as often, you do hear them now, but you do not hear as often um, about the hijab of the, of the man. And, and the fact that the man has to maintain a particular de decorum in society. There is an imbalance here that I and a lot of feminist scholars are beginning to question. Um, similarly, when you talk about uh, the Umahat al Mu'minin, the wives of the Prophet, the mothers of the believers, um, and you talk about the female companions of the Prophet, you find that most debates, most popular lectures, most popular texts within the community speak about their piety, they speak about their modesty, Yes, important aspects of women's identity, perhaps, but I question, are these sufficient? Why is it that when we talk about these women, we do not talk about their business prowess? We know that Khadija was a confident, leading businesswoman who employed Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, um, to lead one of her trade caravans, um, who was confident enough to do that, um, who, was a, who was the first benefactor of the Muslim community. Why is it that when we, we do not talk about the leadership skills that Muslim women had, historic personalities here, I'm going back to, this, um, to the beginning of Islamic history, the Battle of Hudaybiyah, we all, I mean, those of us who aren't um, familiar, it was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, sorry. Um, the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad led a group of companions and sahabas from Medina to Mecca, and they were going to go and perform the pilgrimage there. However, when he reached Mecca, and this is me simplifying the story a lot, he signed a treaty instead with the leaders of Mecca saying that um, we will go back, we will not perform the pilgrimage this year, and, then we, and we shall come back later. And he signed this, and there was rebellion in Muslim ranks. People questioned, how could, he, you know, we've come all the way, we've traversed over the desert simply to do this pilgrimage. And you're saying we're going to go back? The Sahabas, the companions were ready to rebel that day. But Umm Salama, one of the wives of the Prophet who accompanied him said, advised the Prophet, she displayed her, her leadership skill. And she said, you go out there, go into your community, go out into the camp and do what you have to do, remove your, your garments of pilgrimage, shave your head, and the people will follow. And, and this advice, he took the advice and he did as he was told, and, and people followed him. And I sometimes sit back and think, what kind of an Islam would we have had if, if Khatija did, did not act as the first benefactor, if Umar Salama did not give this piece of advice to, the Prophet, to Prophet Muhammad when it was most needed? We do not talk about the scholarship. We would not have had our religion as it is if it wasn't for Aisha and her transmission of hadiths. We do not talk about Sauda's um, manufacturing skills. She made little products out of leather and, and little baskets and sold them on a little cottage industry um, and then used the pro proceeds for philanthrop philanthropic purposes. We do not talk about Muslim women's historical philanthropy and we do not talk about their warrior skills. And these are our questions that we need to answer as a community. Is it most normative narratives of these great historical female personalities who are archetypal role models for all Muslims, men and women, focus on piety, focus on modesty, focus on stillness and quietness? And, and while, as I say, I'm not trying to remove from the significance of these aspects, I, I, I question, are these sufficient? Are these sufficient in a Britain where most of our where our population is inherently a young one. Where our young people want role models they can aspire to be like and emulate. Um, 
we do not seem to be presenting a sufficient uh, narrative to our young people, and that is something we need to address. And that is one reason why we need to demystify the Muslimah historically, but also contemporarily. And these, these readings, these readings that I call limited, these readings that I call incomplete, do end up having implications for how we function in communities, how Muslim women and young, particularly young Muslim women, are treated, and it reflects on the kind of roles that they have in society. Um, when I was in school, I had a friend who was, a, who was brilliant. She was always top of the class. She wanted to be a cardiologist. Um, I discovered a couple of years later she, she got married. Her, and this was because her parents believed um, that women did not really need to play a, a public role. They had to play this domestic role. She, she was happy enough, but I wondered whether as a society we've lost this valuable resource. And, and I also wondered when, how was this logical when, when the Prophet in his famous hadith spoke about going to China in the pursuit of knowledge. He made no distinction between the genders. Um, and these are difficult questions to ask, yet I believe they are questions that need to be raised and need to be reflected upon. I mean, similarly, it's worth thinking about um, mosques in the Indian subcontinent. This is another implication of the limited readings that we have of Islamic theology and, and women's roles in Islamic theology. Why is it that many mosques, most mosques in the Indian subcontinent, do not give access to women, and many mosques here as well? You have limited access or no access, sometimes just a cubby hole. My husband has smuggled me into many mosques, I shall say that. Um, yes, being naughty. But, and then also in the context of women's social roles, you know, a lot of texts, Maududi and his work on, on Aparta and the status of women, Maulana Wahiuddin's work, again, you seem to focus on the domestic role of women. Um, and we do this when Umar, you know, one of the greatest, one of the four righteous caliphs, one of the four righteous caliphs or the, that the Muslim community respects, um, actually appointed a woman Ashifa bin Abdullah as his uh, market inspector. How much more public can you get um, than a market inspector? So there is a tradition within the Muslim community. We need to go back, explore it, and talk about it. I mean, moving beyond these examples, you then look at the statistics. And I could blind you here. I could have bought a presentation with all these statistics. I said, never mind. But over and over again, you and, and, and different Muslim countries all over the world, Muslim communities in the West, you pick up statistics that say Muslim women are less, ed lesser educated, um, lesser employed, and lesser active in society. Now, as, as a feminist researcher, somebody who works with qualitative data, I do not believe and accept that these statistics uh, are telling us the complete story. Yet, it, these statistics do provide us with food for thought. It provides us with some kind of evidence of the impact that some of the ways in which we are reading and implementing and understanding our theology are having on, having on grassroots realities. So whether we like to admit it or not, um, we, we seem to have patriarchy and a pa large patriarchal influence within many Muslim communities all over the globe. Um, such patriarchy has meant that although early Muslim communities, if you go back into history, had a large number of socially, politically, scholarly active women, um, you see as you move through the centuries, according to Aisha Buley and Muhammad Nadwi, in the last 300 years or so, the number of such scholarly active women has really dropped down significantly. And, and people, there are reasons. There is, people say colonialism happened, people say you know, the mosques changed from being these centers of universal learning and, and became rather limited. There are reasons people postulate, but nobody really quite knows what happened. However, there has been a drastic fall in the number of scholars. And Marmaduke Pictol says, again, reflecting what has happened in this last few centuries, he says, the Muslim woman, far from being this frank and noble woman that she was in the past, has become this tricksy and, and intriguing cap captive. And, and Marmaduke Pictol gets quite stern uh, in, in one regard when he talks about um, his life in India. And he says, 
Muslim women were emphatically in India not being given their rights, the, the rights that Islam assures them. And he says this is a crime that the Muslim community will have to face. And for this crime, the Muslim community will have to face increasing social degradation. He said this in 1920. And some of our issues now around young people's achievement in school, etc., may be a reflection of this. I do not know. But there are definitely concerns around the roles of Muslim women. Abdul Hakim Murad Tim Winter says, there is no community, no Muslim community in the world today that actually gives women the status that was um, assigned to them and the roles that were assigned to them in the Quran and the Hadith. And if that statement is true, it is something that as a community we need to act upon and act upon urgently. There is also a corollary to this narrative. Um, and, and, and this is what Zoya Hassan, the Indian sociologist, says. And she says, when it comes to social and policy narratives, the normative Muslim voice is always male. And there was a time, and this is recent, where you struggled if you were you know, running some sort of government consultation, um, or if you looked at research. Most of the sample, most of the participants tended to be male. And, and over the last few years, me, myself, and other colleagues, we've struggled to, to generate this understanding that the experience of women is, and of the female is very different from the experience of the male. And if we want policy, if we want research to be truly relevant, we've got to hear both sides of the story. We've got to hear everybody's experiences. So that's the first part now. My little rant over, <laughs> the angry feminist there. Um, so the other side of this narrative, you know, every coin, two sides, blah, blah. The other side of this narrative is, and it leads me quite nicely to the second aspect of this disconnection. Remember a three-way disconnection. You've got Muslim women, you've got their lived reality, you've got how they are perceived and how they are written about and the rights that are given to them in the Quran. And on this side, you've got how they are perceived in the media. There are three nodes and there seem to be a disconnection. None of these three nodes seem to agree with each other. So there are elements of patriarchy within our community. I've spent you know, the last 10 minutes or so, longer I think, the last 20 minutes talking about patriarchy. I must be angry, sorry. Um, but I am also, through, my, through the same research, very aware of you know, strong, active women who are scholars, who are public figures, who are academics, who are teachers, who are young, who are old, and who are really making a difference within their society. And saying that, I am also aware of their very supportive husbands, brothers, fathers, and sons, who are allowing them, who, who are who facilitating um, space and giving them space to go out and achieve whatever they are, they are achieving. I mean, who examples of these such men, the two men in my life, the little one, the tiny one, and the big one, they've, they've accompanied me to Cardiff to allow me to be able to come out and do this little presentation. And, and this story is not unique. I'm sure lots of women in this room would be able to talk about their fathers who've encouraged them to come out um, to study in university. Um, another example of these supportive men, all the men in this, in this room, without being patronizing in any way, but all the men in this room are, are probably interested in women and their issues, and so they are here to take a stance. We will be behind our women, and we will allow them to achieve what has to be done. Um, you know, last year, I ran this conference that I mentioned briefly on, on Muslim women's activism, and I had women come to attend and present their work from all over the country, indeed from all over the world. And I insisted at this conference, I didn't just want academics, I also wanted activists. And, and the kind of work women were doing, there were dialogians, women engaging in interfaith dialogue, academics, of course, we have to go. If there is a conference, we will go. And, and we will present our paper. But there were people working around FGM, people which is female genital mutilation. There were people running radio channels in America where they talk about women and their work. It was mind-boggling, not an academic phrase, sorry. But it, it was mind-boggling, the kind of work that these women are doing. And again, look into the media, look into normative government speak. You do not hear these stories. You do not hear these stories of 
you, you may want to call it successful, you may want to call it modern. There are different ways to describe what these female activists are doing. But these are the stories that you do not hear. And that is the second part of this disconnection. Where are these success stories? Why do you only hear about the patriarchy? And Robert Richardson says, in relation to this, that when you look at popular narratives of Islam and Muslims, um, the perspective that you usually get is that Islam is this religion that systematically discriminates against women. The poor Muslim woman, she's this damsel in distress who must be saved. This was a popular narrative that was used in the media to justify the Afghanistan war, for example, or that the Afghan woman had to be rescued for the Taliban, so let's go and save her. Now, these narratives are very simplistic. They do not talk about the decades of <coughs> Um, political strife of war and what it had done to break down um, Afghan society almost completely. Yes, what the Taliban is doing to women in Bani and you know was doing is doing still is is something that should, is terribly wrong and should be completely condemned. But I do not think going into Afghanistan and carpet bombing their cities was a way to. Um, liberate women to give women their rights. Indeed, it's probably caused more problems than before. What we need to do is to challenge patriarchy on different levels. We need to challenge it um, in social discourse, in social relationships. We also need to challenge it theologically. Anyway, to come back to what I was talking about, to my point, when you, or you look at oriental texts, look at popular media, you see, you hear descriptions in different ways, modern language, of this beautiful bird in her gilded cage. She's either cruelly oppressed or, or wantonly promiscuous. Yes, this was a narrative. Um, or she was the exotic, different other. She was also, and I add this here, she was the other who was often judged, but who was seldomly asked about her view. Um, and such note, um, tones are very evident in narratives around banning the niqab, for example. Oh, the poor woman, let's rescue her. Um, and the impact of these narratives is very noticeable. When you know, young Muslim women I interviewed, or older Muslim women as well, they told me, you know, they go out into community, people immediately assume that they cannot speak English, although they've been born and brought up here and English is the only language they speak really well. Um, in my religion, belief, discrimination, and equality work, we, we postulated this um, spectrum of discrimination that ranged from harmless, relatively harmless, to the really serious. Um, and the first category here, we called it religion or belief naivety, where people simply do not know um, what to expect. They simply do not know why somebody from a particular religious group is practicing something. They may think, that a Muslim woman who's wearing a hijab has been forced into doing this. Now, when such naivety is, is clubbed together with you know, see more serious suspicions of Islam, perhaps far-right um, thinking, far-right philosophies, the Muslim woman may face more significant discrimination. She, you know, she is visible as a Muslim woman, more so than a man, especially if she's hijab wearing. She's also perceived as weak because she is a woman. This intersectionality in her identity means that you know, women have reported scarves being pulled out, she may be spat at, she may be abused at, in the street she may be called names. And it seems that the Muslimness of a Muslim woman has been sufficient for society to inscribe meanings on her. The patriarchy said, patriarch said, oh, she must be quiet and pious, and he superimposed male honor on her and said she must be protected at all costs from this corrupt world. The male orientalist never met her, but said that she was exotic and this beautiful bird in a cage, senseless bird, the proto-feminist pitied her and wanted to rescue her from her inferior culture. Modernity considered her religious, her religious practice archaic and that her faith made her backward. So the Muslim woman was a damsel in distress, this bird waiting to be rescued, this suppressed, oppressed little thing. Um, waiting to be rescued by whoever was telling the story and that's key. And I ask again in all of this, why wasn't she telling her own story? Where was her voice? And when you look at it, I, I seem to argue that Muslim women seem to be doubly um, marginalized. Firstly, on the one hand, by patriarchy that is still prevalent in aspects of Muslim society, <laughs> that deny her divinely ordained rights. And secondly, by pluralist society that sees her as subjugated, that sees her as oppressed, that sees her as simply different. 
and that sees her as this symbol of visible religion in a world that is becoming increasingly more secular. And somewhere in this quagmire, the Muslim woman's voice is stuck. And so I said, fine, I'll go out and listen to the Muslim woman's voice. I'll go out and see what they have to say from themselves. What were their stories going to be like? Um, and I spoke to women like Basaria, and you, you are going to be able to listen to her story in a minute. Hi, um, my name is Basria. My friends call me Baz. Uh, I'm a young British Muslim and Manchester is home. I'm a firm believer that um, everyone has a capability to do something with their life, if only they were to avail the opportunity that life throws at them. Um, it's a matter of recognizing their potential and believing in it. This is what I call ambition and I'm going to talk about mine. Since my teenage years, I've always been inspired by my father who is a lawyer and an imam, uh, a Muslim faith leader. Uh, I've always wanted to follow in his footsteps, as in practice my faith and become a legal professional. Uh, I've just recently completed my law degree at Warwick University and intend to go on to the legal practice course next year. I hope to be a successful, high-flying, jet-setting lawyer, and I think I am capable of being just that. This ambition was nurtured by my interest in society, politics and history, something which has grown and further solidified over the years. However, my desire of working in a legal field is a means to an end rather than an end itself. It is a stepping stone through which I want to move on to larger, bigger and more important things. In all honesty, my dream is to work in the voluntary and developmental sector, a career move which I see as my true calling. My motivation is to make a positive change in society, however minimal that may be. I want to do my bit in life. My faith teaches me to help others whenever and wherever possible, and my parents practice this and have inculcated this in me. For if you change one life, you have changed all of humanity. I want to work with children and give them a sense of hope. I have realized from my experience that often it is not aid that is required, but it's empowerment which is needed, as in empowerment to build and better their lives and hence their futures. Therefore, it's not aid that they need, but renewable sources of livelihood, including education, energy, work, incomes, and inspiration, so in order to enable them to stand on their own feet. Uh, I have realized that working towards this will give me true satisfaction and a sense of fulfillment something which paychecks and bonuses cannot attain. At the end of my life, when I stand in front of God, I hope to say to him, I did something for your people and only to please you, as we say in Islam, to attain his raza, which means his pleasure. To end, I would like to say that I know that God loves his people, as well as the fact that helping human beings means that in fact you are pleasing your Lord. These are my ambitions, all of which I believe are tangible and attainable in my lifetime. And this is my story. These were the conversations that I had with young Muslim women all over England. Um, they said inspiring and interesting things, and I cannot aim to, you know, summarize everything that they said, but I shall try and give you a snapshot today. That has not happened before. Um, and I also recognize that their narratives are very different from those of their mothers. But I chose in that piece of research to focus on, on these young Muslims because they're probably the future of, of British Islam. Now these women told me about their Britishness and their Muslimness being two sides of their identity and how they valued and respected both. They told me about Britain being home. They also spoke to me, and this was really interesting, about reclaiming their faith. And when I combine this with a lot of women's scholarship, Muslim women's scholarship that has been taking place over the last few years, um, you know, Aisha Buley and her classical um, scholarship and her translation of classical Arabic text, Bad Margot Badran and Lamia al Faruqi's work on feminism, Bakhtiyar's first translation of the Quran into English by a woman, you begin to see that this quiet revolution is taking place that seeks to reinstate women in the annals of history, Islamic history, Islamic theology, so that they can tell their own story, they can reclaim their rightful place. Now, many disagree with me and um, when I say that I think this activism, this activism, 
uh, and this reflection is a clear reflection of a nascent form of feminism, Muslim women's feminism. Um, I think the simplest, truest definition of feminism is that it means equal rights and respect for women. And, and I believe this fully chimes with what the Quran has been saying. And I've spoken about this in chapter 4.1, about the, being created out of the same soul, about being protectors of one another, about having equal um, reward from their creator. I don't see a problem. I see a chiming between feminism and, and classical Islamic theology. Yet, some Muslim scholars, many women indeed, there were women who said, we will not talk to you, Saria, because we call you a feminist. And that's... As a feminist, I respect their view to do that. Um, so there is this love-hate relationship, like Marmite. Some people absolutely love feminism, like myself, like the author, Shalina Jan Muhammad, who wrote Love in a Headscarf. Um, we, we like calling ourselves feminists. We would do that. Others would not. Um, it's, there's no pat answer, as Lamia Farooqi says. I believe these disagreements with feminism are more due to this to misunderstandings. A lot of feminists think about Islam as this patriarchal misogynist faith. A lot of Muslims think about, um, think that feminism is this anti-religion philosophy. Um, I actually think feminism is a philosophy that isn't aimed just at women. It isn't aimed at, at, un, at looking at the relationship between men and women, between the sexes. It is aimed at giving rights and, and resources to any marginalized group. Because as you, because you see, when, when the feminists went out to develop a methodology that they could use to work with Muslim women, with, with any women who they felt were marginalized, they discovered along that route that lots of other groups were marginalized as well. People were marginalized on account of their race, on account of their religion, on account of their poverty. They also realized in doing all of this that the systems of knowledge were very hierarchical and women often did not have a place in systems of knowledge. So they were not the people who created knowledge, they were not the people who disseminated knowledge. And in creating a methodology to address this issue, feminism became something that was more universal, something that was egalitarian, that could talk to men and women and people from different races and different religions and different communities. According to Jane Flack, she says, Fem feminist philosophy thus represents the return of the oppressed, of the exposure of particular social roots of all apparently abstract and universal knowledge. Feminism is a revolutionary theory and practice. It simultaneously requires an incorporation, negation, and transformation of all human history, including existing philosophies. And this methodology, when applied to Muslim communities in the West, where we've got to deal with being minorities in, in a context that has issues around Islamophobia, issues around terrorism, radicalization. This is a methodology that I, I believe at least would be very useful. Yes, there are problems with feminism. It isn't this be all and end all that answers all your questions. Um, there were three waves of feminism. And, and within itself, feminism tries to, to address its problems. And it isn't one feminism. It is many different feminisms. The first wave of feminism, the suffragettes, um, people who, women here in the West who worked for women's rights to vote, women's rights to property. These were seen as very white, very middle class, um, and, and almost very blinkered, that did not understand the social context of women who came from different backgrounds. And so you move on to the second phase of feminism where you see women from different ethnicities branching out, still retaining this focus on rights and respects for women, but incorporating their own social um, context, if I may. So the black American women created what was called womanism. And, and Latino women created the Muharista movement, both of which incorporated the theological understandings of these women, their religious beliefs. Bra burning never really happened. Um, that's one myth. And then you move on to the third, third wave of feminist thought. And here you begin to see more problems emerge. OK, third wave feminists are talking about sexual liberation and control of your reproductive rights. And yes, people see disconnections here. But even here, you find um, issues and thoughts that chime with what a Muslim woman wants, a reclamation of women's authority, independence, economic independence. Doesn't um, Islam give women economic independence? Even you know, whatever she earns, she controls. 
And so coming back then, looking at how Muslim women may engage with feminism and what kind of form this Muslim feminism may take. Um, firstly, and I agree with Elizabeth Fernia that it is very much rooted in their faith. Yes, there are forms of feminism, for example, Ayan Hirsi Ali's form of feminism. She happened to be Muslim, she rejects Islam. And can you call that an Islamic feminism? I would say not necessarily. Whereas women who are working within the Muslim community, who are going out and dealing with everyday issues with mosques and imams and, and you know, counseling, all kinds of issues, that's perhaps, but doing so by rec reclaiming their faith, doing so by going back to the text and say, look, this is what the text say. I disagree with you. Now let me into the mosque, please. Um, that's probably more of the kind of Islamic feminism that I'm talking about. It's more familial. It is also undertaken, and, and here I agree with the French philosopher Michel Ledoff, it seems to be undertaken in partnership with men. Um, men in the mosque, men in the family who encourage and. And yes, you can have male feminists, as in, in most feminisms. I hope everybody here is a male feminist <laughs> and female feminist, sorry. Um, and there is this strong element of religious reclamation throughout. Um, there is one criticism, though, that I, you know, apart from the criticisms of feminism per se, the other criticism that I encounter is around nomenclature and words. Um, people say, how can we use this word? It belongs to somebody else. It belongs to a different community. But women in the West whom I spoke to and whose feminisms I'm talking about, they belong in this community. Um, English is their language. West, Western feminist philosophical thought is their own thought. And there, there is another argument to this as well. Within the Muslim community, you have a long tradition of engaging with the philosophies, the scientific development, with the thoughts of communities who are other than Muslim. The early Muslim thinkers in the Dark Ages picked up Greek thought, um, developed it, advanced it, and then gave it on to the European thinkers in, in, after the Reformation, after the um, Enlightenment. Iqbal worked with Indian philosophy. He worked with Western philosophies and then worked with Islamic philosophies and came out with a thought that was unique and that is, is to date very relevant, particularly to Indians in the subcontinent. So there is a space to bridge philosophies, and there is a space to bridge feminisms, I would say. So to conclude then, I hope you've enjoyed this talk. I hope you've enjoyed my little rant at the beginning. Um, I believe there is great power in Muslim women's voices, in their nar narratives and in their stories. I call this feminist power. We may disagree, but it's definitely feminine power. It is definitely female power, girl power, like the Powerpuff Girls. Um, then I shared the digital stories, you know, like Basarias with communities from who were not Muslim. Um, an overwhelming 82% reported that after hearing these stories and their voices, they felt more positive, and their perceptions towards Muslim women became more positive. Um, in store. We recognize people and places um, by the stories that we know. My work with Muslim women indicates that for a long time they, were, they weren't allowed to tell their own stories. For a long time, their voices had disappeared from this from the storytelling genre, if I may. Stories are important. Stories potentially capture a nuanced and complex picture of a group that includes differences. It includes things that we do not say. It includes cultures, it includes customs. Um, and, in recognize, and in watching these stories and in looking at the similarities and the differences, people began, this, these women allowed, these Muslim women who, who told their stories began a process of demystific, demystification of themselves um, and also of their faith. People who watched their stories were encouraged to reflect on how these people were not just Muslim women, they were women, they were human beings. Um, and I, as the researcher sitting at the back bench, looking at how people were reacting, began to realize the potential of the personal narrative to facilitate dialogue. Muslim faces were telling these stories, um, but they could have, according to the, my audiences, these could have been women from any, more, any backgrounds. They were no longer the bird in the cage. They were no longer the different other. They were no longer the damsel in distress. These were real women with real experiences, going to university, standing at a bus stop. The Muslim woman's story was now familiar, and it was not characterized by difference. Thus, in giving, taking, and hearing Muslim women's voices, in, we, 
I, I enabled the process of interfaith and intercommunity dialogue. I could not have done it with, without the women who actually told their stories. This, I believe, is the greatest achievement of my work, to, to, to have a shred more, a little more understanding of how different we are and to allow all these different aspects of what, when we are indeed a pluralist society to understand each other a little better. That's my presentation. Thank you for listening.